Thanks for joining us again for another edition of Canada Interviews for Windsor County. I'm here today with Keith Capolini from Plymouth, who's running as an independent for the Windsor 5 House seat. Welcome, Keith. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Why don't we start off by having you just introduce yourself to the voters out there who, who might not know you or haven't met you yet. Uh, give a little bit of your background, your experience, and what you'd bring to Montpelier. My name is Keith Capolini. I'm a selectman over in the town of Plymouth. I'm in the second year of a three-year term. I'm also on the Planning and Zoning Commission there. Uh, I was recently appointed chair of the uh, local Cannabis Control Commission, and I also served on the school board for the WCSU, one of Plymouth's uh, two seats. I have a seven-year-old son. Uh, his name is Eugene. He races go-karts on the weekends. I'm his dedicated crew chief. Um, we also like to partake in all that Vermont has to offer via the outdoors, whether it be uh, hunting or fishing, uh, baseball in the spring. Um, we also like snow sports and snowmobiling and all that fun stuff. We built a cabin up on my land and we spend a lot of time up there. All right. Do you hunt? I do. All right. I'm looking forward to uh, upcoming deer season. We're going out to put up some cameras this weekend, as a matter of fact. Did you get any last year? Oh yeah, every year. Every year. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my son was with me this past year, so it was pretty special. We, you know, we got to participate in, in the whole experience from, you know, taking down the deer to going out and finding it and bringing it back. So it was, it was definitely a, a bonding moment. Pretty cool. Do you process? Do you do, you do the butchering yourself? Or I do don't. You take it somewhere? No, I don't. We take it. Do you have like anything special made or? Uh, you know, cuts or, all the cuts, everything, yeah. break it all down, sausage, a little bit of everything, you know. And how long will that last you? Like a year or yeah. till the next time? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We got uh, oh, yeah, we got a little bit of last year's, you know, when we took this one down this year. We still had a little bit of the previous years, but, you know, it's uh, it's good to have a freezer full of meat, I think. Yeah. It sounds like you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of interest in local politics. You're pretty involved in your community. Why are you choosing to run for a higher office and represent the county? Uh, well, I have, I kind of started uh, in the opposite direction. I did run uh, previously once before in 2016 for this seat. Um, after having lost to Charlie Kimball, I uh, kind of did an about face and decided to get involved more locally and uh, threw myself into uh, politics at the local level. Um, first thing I did was uh, get onto the Planning and Zoning Commission and uh, started learning the nuts and bolts of, you know, people coming in from the town to apply for permits and, you know, variances and, you know, the real, you know, down in the dirt type of what it takes to run a town. Um, that led to me being elected as a, a selectman. Um, and I've been, as I say, doing that for about two years now. And uh, you get to really see where the, you know, the rubber meets the road, what, you know, what it, what's involved in actually in governing, you know, it's more than party politics, it's people with, you know, actual needs, you know, that they're either for their residents or for their business, um, you know, and things need to get done. You know, there's no uh, pontificating about it. Decisions need to be made and people need to, you know, m often, you know, money's involved and, you know, taxation is another one of those issues that you, you really learn about, you know, how taxes are levied and, you know, where the money goes, where it comes from. Um, the same applies to my time on the school board, you know, seeing how, you know, you know, the, the vast apparatus at play there, you know, especially after Act 46. Um, so that's kind of how I cut my teeth. Um, and why do I want to run for the seat again? Well, I've spent like about five years now, you know, at, at the local level in various different roles. And, you know, there's only so much you you can do. And uh, I think given the experience that I've, I've garnered, um, I'd probably be, you know, somewhat of an asset up in Montpelier, I think, you know, you bring the same toolbox, it's just at a bigger level. So that's why I'm running. All right, so you're running as an independent. Yes. Now, I know a lot of voters, if they see the I on the ballot, they might not know anything about your platform, whereas with D or an R, it's kind of easier to figure out where they stand on certain issues. Um, how would you define yourself politically uh, and, and what, what, is your, what is your platform if you were pitching it to a voter? That's a good question, it's kind of, Multifaceted, I guess. You know, there's many parts to that. It's a big question. Um, you know, for me, I, you know, in the intro phase there, we can. I didn't mention I have an advanced degree in uh, economics um, from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, so I kind of look at everything through that lens. And uh, I mean, if I had to sum up my platform in one phrase, it'd be dollars and cents. Um, 
you know, and I've learned a lot of that, as I say, at the local level, I mean, the taxation part of it, seeing, you know, <laughs> just how much, you know, people both pay and how much, you know, the state of Vermont, uh, you know, needs to levy and to pay for everything. So, I mean, I take that approach in terms of, and, you know, as why I run as an independent, because I think no matter what side of the aisle you're on, you know, I think it all boils down to dollars and cents, you know, whether or not you, know, you care, uh, you know, pick whatever hot button issue you want, whatever third rail you want to touch. At the end of the day, you know, I think, you know, most people are looking, uh, especially these days, at what things cost. And, you know, a great example, um, you know, another thing that me and my son like to do, we, uh, you know, we, we restore classic cars together, and I've been doing that my whole life. My dad did it, but uh, you know we're always looking for you know the next project. But I was surfing uh, Facebook Marketplace this morning, saw an ad come up, and it's typical of all you know the types of ads you see lately. Uh, you know, three tow trucks for sale. You know, the headline was you know moving south. You know, moving my business south. You know, make me an offer on all my trucks. And I mean that's. You know that's kind of the um, my mailer went out just the other day, and you know that's. There should be a place for, you know, uh, you know, wherever you may lie on certain issues and we all have our own, you know, places that we <laughs> that we fall on, you know, what side of the aisle. We I think there's got to be a place for everybody here in the state to make ends meet. And I think most people are having a lot of trouble doing that. And, uh, you know, that would be how I would approach my role as a state rep to make it more affordable, especially for people like my, you know, I'm self-employed, I have, you know, raising a kid, you know, so a uh, single dad, it's not easy to, and it's in this state to do that. So. So what are, what are some things you think Vermont could be doing differently to help make it more affordable for people? Yeah, I, in terms of, you know, we can touch two things, I guess, taxes, uh, you know, I've learned a hell of a lot about, you know, the property taxes and you know how and, and the funding of education and how act 46 played into that and for me i think returning you know taking a closer look at act 46 and maybe turning back the clock on it and returning some you know control to local communities in terms of you know <laughs> you know it all boils down again dollars and cents when local control of schools meant local control of the purse more or less I mean, the amount of, I sign the checks, I see what goes up to Montpelier. It's it's astronomical. You know how much of that money comes back? A percentage to the to our each particular union. But you know, <laughs> take Plymouth for example. In 2009, uh, you know, pre Act 46, um, you know, people voted mostly people with second homes or retirees or people with no kids, three to one to close the Plymouth school. So Plymouth had no school as of you know basically. 2009, 2010, um, the same people more or less voted three to one to, you know, for Act 46. Um, in terms of the the uh, the breakdown and how that particular piece of legislation was sold, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, the carrot, and there's the carrot and the stick if you didn't join by a certain date, but, you know, the carrot hung out was the tax breaks and certain percentages, you know, they've already blown past you know what those percentages would would uh, would backstop. So, for all rights and purposes, you know what was sold is kind of not what came to fruition, and we're left with a uh, um, you know we're left with a consolidation that leaves you know local communities really just signing checks and not having a say um, and what goes on at the local level. You know, yes, you know I was a member to the board of the WCSU, but it's a proportional board and, you know, Woodstock had the most seats, you know, eight to two. So, of course, the bigger towns have more sway and, you know, that could be good or bad. But, I mean, that's one thing that we could look at in terms of making things more affordable um, and having people have a, you know, more say in, in the way uh, tax, you know, uh, taxes are levied. Uh, another aspect of that is the, the gold town phenomenon, like Plymouth's considered a gold town. So, you know, large chunks of, the, of our tax money as raised and levied is, you know, siphoned off and put into other uh, school districts that are, you know, not considered a gold town. So, you know, that's also, you know, you could have a leveling effect if, you know, you had a different uh, take on how those uh, funds were allocated. Um, in terms of uh, raw dollars and cents and how people make a living, I think, um, you know, we 
and I said this the last time I ran. I mean, we we take for granted the 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 uh, you know, the, the hands-on knowledge and the and the industrial base that used to exist in Vermont. And in terms of you know, we used to have the, you know the greatest machine tool industry in you know in the world. They, you know, they used to call it you know help feed. You know, it was a bombing target in the Second World War. Um, all that knowledge. You know, it's kind of withered on the vine. You can go down to Springfield, you kind of see it, you know, the remains of it. It's like an old dinosaur. But, you know, whether or not we revitalize that is, is per se, it's more about, you know, what does Vermont have to offer the, you know, the, the, the region, the United States, the world? I, I would say investing more in, in hands-on learning here, you know, uh, in technical education and trying to, you know, reinvigorate you know, something that kind of already exists under the undercurrent rather than trying to, you know, not saying that we can't be the next tech hub or whatever. Sure, great, maybe, why not? But, you know, when push comes to shove, there's a lot of, you know, kids, my kid included, that likes to, you know, he's interested in going to the, you know, the museum down in Springfield, you know, Precision Valley Museum and working with his hands. Why not, you know, why not invest in that? Why not invest like 25 million bucks over five years, say, into technical programs around the state? Why not bring, you know, all the money that's thrown into STEM classes? Why not bring back shop class and welding class? And, you know, there's a lot of interest in that. And, you know, the trades are very important in Vermont. And you know, I think it's kind of, it's a neglected uh, sphere that we don't, we don't appreciate enough. It seems like there is a growing realization in Montpelier about exactly that, that people are waking up to the fact that we do need to invest more in our tech, tech schools and in the trades, uh, especially if we want to build all the housing we're going to need to house people affordably. Um, and I know we got a big infusion of COVID relief funds and a lot of that was, was put into these things. But it seems like when that money dries up, we're back to figuring out how we're going to use Vermont tax dollars to pay for all that. Back to the issue of property taxes, there's long been talk about moving away from a property value model to just income for funding education. Would you support something like that? Does that make more sense? I mean, yes, it could if, if if people were earning, you know, were able to earn a decent living whereby they were able to generate the income to, to you know, to pay into that. It's, you know, we're kind of in the same boat as New Hampshire in terms of, you know, property tax, you know, how it's used to fund municipal needs. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get away from that model per se, but I think that I think that, as I say, moving back towards a, a you know more of a local control of the funds, you know, maybe they're like in the you know in the current model we have, um, there's a you know the Montpelier's pushing a new you know property assessment you know to be completed by uh, within I think it's in the next. Um, it's got to be within the next 18 months, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that's what it is. And, uh, you know, the, the point being uh, to lock in the current, you know, valuations, assessments at the current inflated valuations, you know, due to all the, you know, over the last 18 months or so, the, you know, property values have skyrocketed due to the COVID refugees and, you know, inflation. And so, I mean, that that in itself is kind of, you know, it's kind of part and parcel, uh, you know, we're, locked into this and we just keep pushing it further to the you know to the point where it's not sustainable you know that if like my own particular house you know if or anybody in my neighborhood if they let you know do a reassessment and and reassess it what you know zillow says my house is worth i mean you're talking about doubling the taxes no one can you know no one i know can afford that you know so what happens at that point? Like I said earlier, you know, there's plenty of ads of people moving. I just, good friends of mine, you know, have been up here as long as I have. Um, you know, they just sold their house, you know, two weeks ago and they're moving to South Carolina. Two children, you know, basically my kid's sandwich in between them. They've grown up together, but they just can't do it anymore. So, you know, they bought a house with more land than they've got here with taxes that are, you know, less than a quarter of what they pay. And, you know, they're looking, for, <laughs> looking forward to it. And that's a, that's a typical theme. It's not like you meet people, you know, that are excited, they're, you know, that with kids, you know, they're kind of like, wow, it's expensive to live here. So, you know, it's, it's a definite, it's a problem that Vermont has. It's not just in this district. It's how do we keep, you know, how do we make it so that people want to come here and, and stay here and make a living? 
not come. And even kids that go to college, you know, they often it's a brain drain. You know, they're going wherever, Boston or Concord or, you know, they're just not staying here either, even if they do go to school here. So, I mean, I, I try to wrap my head around how do we make Vermont more affordable and there, there aren't a lot of easy answers. Well, it's none of it's easy, but I mean, basic back of the envelope math, and I mean, these numbers are pretty rough, you know, they're round, but like the one quarter check, you know, we that goes up to Montpelier, you know, so the municipality got basically 3% of the take, you know, they would say like a $1.4 million check, okay? So we got about $7,000 of that, Plymouth, the town. Then the WCSU gets their percentage, which comes out to be roughly 330000 So roughly a million bucks goes up to Montpelier. You know, we, you know, and that happens, you know, four times a year. So I know just from what it takes to run our, we still have our school building in Plymouth. It's called the Community Center now. We have programs in there. One of them is a, a daycare program, which has been highly successful. But, uh, you know, we still heat it and maintain it and pay the electric. And, you know, so we got a really good idea of what it costs to run the building. I know we could hire two, three teachers and put them in there and have a school like they used to have, you know, with whatever, say, 25, 30 kids. And we would pay, we would spend nowhere near, you know, you know, not even a third of that money. So why would why does Plymouth you know, if Plymouth can educate its own students, its own estimated pupil base, you know, pay fair salaries to teachers, maintain its own school building. Why, why do we need to levy that amount of tax, you know, property tax to send off to fund other school districts, you know, big now consolidated districts with massive bureaucracies all around the state? Why do we, why does the town of Plymouth have to do that. Why does the town of Reading have to do that? Reading's going through, you know, they lost their school because of Act 46. People were very angry down there. People that voted for, you know, some, some of the, you know, for the cast of characters that have been around forever. You know, well, how could you do this? Well, you know, they were the main sponsors of Act 46. You know, Reading can do the same thing. You know, they can, you know, whatever, 50 some odd kids down there, they can very easily raise enough new taxes locally to hire the team. I think they had four teachers. So they can pay for teachers and, 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 and operate their building just fine. So that's what I mean. It, it's not definitely not easy to try and accomplish that. But like Plymouth did have a school and Plymouth did pay teachers and run a school. Reading did. You know, it's it's all within the realm of possibility. It's just the political will to make it happen. As, do, I mean, do you think these effects of Act 46 could be reversed? I mean, obviously, we're talking about a system that's also based on Act 60 and 68, which don't seem to be, doesn't seem to be much will uh, to change those or, or create something new from scratch. Yeah, well, that ties back into what you said in the opening here, you know, and trying to, you know, nail down where I'm at on the spectrum. I, I think, you know, partisanship in this particular state is a failed enterprise because there's no, uh, you know, <laughs> the Republicans, you know, give uh, a lot of heat to, to Governor Scott, but you know, at the end of the day, he's been very successful and, you know, kind of attacking his, his ship between, you know, he's been able to govern because he's been able to, you know, see different sides of, you know, of an issue. Um, you know, the political will to, to do things like repeal Act 46, you know, that's what it would take. I mean, any piece of legislation is reversible. It's just a matter of the political will to get it done. You know, the same applies to something like Act 250 and, you know, development. You know, you said affordable housing. You know, <laughs> you can't build anything if you can't, you know, if you can't develop. I mean, South Carolina, North Carolina, right now, North Carolina, I mean, it's on fire. You know, me and my kid watch a show on YouTube, Let's Dig. It's about a guy you know, uh, that runs an excavation company and, you know, he, he literally works. You know, my kid will be like, wow, he's, he just posted this, you know, two hours. He, he works every day running, clearing, that's all he's doing, clearing land, putting in developments. You know, I'm not saying we go out and, and bulldoze Vermont because Vermont has, you know, something that a lot of states don't have. It has a natural character. So you have to preserve that. But at the same time, if it takes, you know, three years to get permits to put up a, you know, multifamily building, you know, what you got then is what you got up and, uh, you know, you go drive around Burlington, all the run down, beat up, you know, multifamily housing. You can't build anymore, really. The projects that they've got up there have been mired and, you know, 
years of red tape. They still haven't come to fruition. So, you know, something you can't have your cake and eat it too, too as the old saw. You know, you got to, there's ways to save the environment and build responsibly. You know, they do it in places like Germany and the Netherlands and, you know, they don't, they, everything, they, you can make it work if you want. It's just a matter of, again, political will and trying to navigate the polarization of, you know, <laughs> they're independent, uh, you know, I keep pointing here, but you know, Democrats, Republicans, it's no, you can't, at the end of the day, you can't hole off, you know, put the, draw the shutters down and, you know, get behind these big tent pole issues and then not do anything at the ground level, you know. If we did that on the select board, you know, the town would just cease to exist and you know, nothing would happen. You know, it doesn't matter what you think about abortion, you know, if I, you know, you got a class four road running through your backyard that people are hiking up on and they're bothering you, you know, in the middle, you know, I have to solve that problem for you. It doesn't matter what we think about that. And the same attitude's got to be brought to, you know, the state house. You got to just work with each other to govern Vermont, not govern, you know, Washington, not govern whatever. It's, this is about Vermont, and that's what I tell everybody all the time. I mean, it's not about, you know, national politics. It's about a, a state representative seat. You're supposed to represent the people of your district and their problems and their concerns. So if you were elected, would you seek to do away with Act 250 or reform it to try to streamline the process a I little more? I definitely reform it. I mean, yeah. it's, and I think, uh, you know, Charlie Kimball, you know, started the Paul Rowan and that on that front, you know, that was one of his projects as the representative of this district. Um, you know, it's, there's ways to, as I say, you know, save the, and protect the environment, but it's still build housing for people. I mean, I don't see, you know, there's no magic bullet. You can't put up a multifamily housing project and without actually putting it up, you know what I mean? So there has to be a way to do it. Otherwise, we're still talking about the same problems. We don't have enough housing in Vermont. We don't. You know, there's Plymouth, you know, there's no, people ask me all the time, you know, any housing, no, any housing, no, there is, there's nothing. So we can build something, you know, there's grants at the local level to revitalize, you know, town centers, you know, you can, you know, multifamily money is, there's money in there for doing that, you know, but, uh, you know, you got to have the political will to, to make it happen. So Act 250, development, economics. Uh, seems to be what you're most fired up about. If you're elected, do you have preference for what committee you'd like to be on, where you think you could best serve? I think I'd like to be on the, yeah, the Economic Development Committee. I think that would be, you know, when it comes to nuts and bolts, I can probably offer the most there. Have you, have you talked with, with Charlie Kimball much about his experience? Uh, we've chatted, you know, he comes to the town meeting and whatnot, and yeah, we, we uh, we have talked about a lot of bigger, a lot of the bigger tent pole issues as well. You know, yeah. we agree on some, others not, but sure. and that's the way it goes. Well, I remember when I was in office, the one of the big issues was, was health care. There was all this talk that we were going to create a single payer health care system, and then they looked at the numbers and didn't see a way to do it. Do you have any any ideas for how to address? The healthcare. I, you know, I won't crisis. lie to you and say that that's any you know uh, sector that I uh, am very expert at. I don't, uh, you know, I do know <laughs> based on my own personal experience, it's extremely expensive to secure healthcare in, in Vermont. Um, in terms of a single payer system, I you know I don't believe that's necessarily the answer. I mean, which it's ob obviously contingent upon the tax base, and you know, you know Vermont again, you know, brave little state. I mean, it's a an exceptionally beautiful place. It's an exceptionally beautiful state, but it's tiny, and there's just there isn't a, a huge tax base here to begin with. So, you know, every program needs to be paid for one way or the other. And you know, unfortunately, with this ARPA money that's come through, American Rescue Plan Act money, we've gotten you know even the little town of Plymouth got you know an eighty some odd thousand. Or no, what am I saying? Hundred and something, hundred forty thousand bucks. You know, so everybody that has touched every corner of the state, and you know, it was kind of like a sugar high, and that it was spent, and all all the programs. But uh, you know, I just I I I lived in Germany for you know several years, and um, you know, received healthcare there, and you know, it, it's an exceptional system. Sure, it's amazing to be able to go to the doctor, and you know, you don't. There's no change of exchange of funds. You know, you sign and. 
and you know, which is theoretically and fundamentally how it should be, but that's not how it is in the United States. And there's, you know, we can talk about it till you know the sky turns blue, and you know, it's not going to. You know, that's unfortunately not how we do business here in the United States. Could we do things differently? I think, look, you know, New Hampshire, their costs are nowhere near what they are here, and their system is run. You know, it's one of the you know top five systems always. You know, rankings wise, you know, healthcare systems in, in the United States. So I think maybe looking. You know, across the river, and and so what New Hampshire does. I mean, anyone can tell you. I mean, probably you can. If you go to Dartmouth Hitchcock, you know, it's versus going to a, a hospital here. It's, I mean, it's night could be a night and day experience. So, obviously, it's possible. It's just a matter again, you know, political will, monies. Obviously, New Hampshire has a much better tax base. You know, a much better economy than Vermont for many of the reasons. You know that. We don't, you know, things that we could do here that you know that they do, and so I think, that, you know, again, dollars and cents. If we had the money, we could obviously do something like that. But we got to get costs down, and there's ways to do that. It's just a matter of, you know, brokering with the insurance companies and all that. Would it be fair to label you a fiscal conservative? Oh yeah. Okay. What about social issues? Where do you stand on like the hot button social issues of the day? Well, like name one. <laughs> Prop five, reproductive rights. I mean, I you know, I don't see you know making it a, a a political issue. You know, I'm kind of more of a libertarian on issues like that. I don't see it as you know, I don't see you know the the and the object of of uh, regulating abortion on a moral ground to me is you know no you know it's it's your body, your choice. You want to do it. You know, I'm not gonna stand in your way. You know, but that applies across the board for me. I mean, it's, you know, you do what you want to do. I mean, that's kind of fundamentally the way I look at all these, you know, cannabis the same way. I mean, I don't believe it should be, uh, you know, I believe it should be regulated for sure. And I think there's ways it could be done much better than the way it's about to be unfurled. But, you know, it's the same. Um, Social, there's tons of them. You know, I won't throw any, throw myself under the bus unless you ask me directly. But wow, someone's going to ask you. Huh? Well, sure. So, are you are you campaigning? Are you out there knocking on doors and and meeting people and hearing? Well, I'm not in Plymouth. You know, I was I just hopefully enough people and folks there know me. Um, yeah. I did. I put a ton of time into campaigning door to door. I think I went to most doors back in '16 with my kid who was in the stroller then, and mm -hmm. you know, I did. Uh, I did the you know, the serious door to door, and, and I, I have to say I'm not this time. Um, not that I won't at all, but you know I've taken a different uh, tack, doing some things that I didn't do last time, like this uh, you know district wide mailer that I just sent out. So I'm hoping that uh, you know folks get to you know see that in their mailbox, maybe take a look at my website, maybe see this video, and uh, you know maybe come out and vote on the eighth. So you mentioned you're a single dad. And you say you're self-employed. Mm -hmm. So how would you how would you adapt to the legislative schedule? Because a lot of people have a hard time with that. I, I certainly did being self-employed in the off season, running a business, but also being, you know, full time engaged uh, in the winter with not very much pay. It's a good, it's a good question. You know, I don't. I haven't. Uh, you know, I'm, I have the flexibility that you know that it won't. I won't not be able to get up there. Well, I have to change things around, certainly. You know, I think the biggest impact for me would be with my kid. Um, so, you know, that bridge I cross when I come to it, but, um, you know, there's the, uh, you know, the inevitable uh, trial by fire, so to speak. But I also think <laughs> in that regard, you know, I kind of supported, uh, when Governor Scott first ran, he had a proposition to limit the legislative session um, to just, uh, you know, a few, a few months, you know, I think he had it down to 90 days, um, every two years. So, you know, Montana does it that way. There's quite a few states that do it that way. You come once every two years for a couple of months, do your business and go home. You know, I'm all for that. I don't believe in, you know, career politicians. I don't, I believe firmly in term limits. I think everybody should, you know, go serve, you know, serve the public and go back to whatever you were doing before, you know, sitting in, in a, in, a, in a seat, especially a state rep seat or state senate seat for, you know, I won't mention any names, but, you know, this district, you know, the combined incumbency of, of, of three state senators was, you know, over you know, almost 70 years. So, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's got to, you know, things are going a certain way, you know, it's, 
It's it's not rocket science, I don't believe. You know, in terms of a, a, a representative republic, whether it's national, or local level, things aren't working. The idea is to you know vote someone else in that maybe will, you know, give it a different, give it a shot, a different way. Maybe that'll you know re they'll represent you in a different way. But if you things are still <laughs> going and you know things are getting progressively you know more difficult, you know, making the same choice over and over again is. Know, conducive to get the same result. But if the voters keep picking those people, I mean, I, I'm, I'm on the fence about term limits because I kind of see the elect the election process as, you know, sort of a way to limit someone's term, you know, vote them out. Act 46, I mean, that's a prime example of what we're talking about. I mean, there are folks that I spoke to, you know, directly in Reading that just couldn't believe it. And when I was on the school board, I mean, there were some pretty, you know, tense meetings about the closure of the Reading School. And, you know, I would always say the same thing. I mean, did you, who did you vote, you know, who did you vote for? Oh, well, you know, well, there's the answer to your question, ma'am. Well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, that, that, that there, there's who sponsored the legislation. You know, that's why we are, we're at where we're at. If had you maybe, you know, you know, I mean, and that, that, you know, Devil's advocate, that was a Byzantine piece of legislation. You know, I actually had a group in Plymouth, you know, a, a Facebook group where I was trying to help, uh, you know, fellow townspeople negotiate it and figure it out. And it was, you know, unless you had hours of time to, you know, commit to deciphering it, it was very difficult to understand all the, you know, it was a big ponderous piece of legislation that just got, you know, sure, you know, it was packaged in a neat little box that, Oh yeah, it's going to reduce taxes, and everybody kind of oh, that's a good idea, and you know didn't read the fine print, and you know, we're and we're in the spot we are now. But yeah, I was there when Act Forty Six passed, and I voted against it because I was I was concerned about our little school closing. Um, it hasn't yet, um, and the trends, you know, we're getting more people moving into our town now, and I think more kids in the school, so. We might have dodged a bullet at least for a little while, but yeah, I had I had those concerns about just consolidating. And where does it end? You know, how far are we going to be sending our kids on the bus? And it was a tough one. I think it's kind of it's synonymous though with the I, as I see it, it's kind of the it's a mindset. You know, that localized control, whether it be of education or you know anything for that matter. In Vermont, is kind of what Vermont is. I mean, it, Vermont is you know valleys and you know each one is on its own unique little community and with its own fair and its own school and it's I mean the schools were integral to the communities and you know everything revolved around it. I mean when Plymouth lost its school I mean a lot of community went away with that there's no central focus anymore your children are you know any your town's future and you know if you take that away and strip it away and make a you know New Jersey style centralized school district and make everybody go there in a bus it kind of you know defeats the purpose of Vermont why you know we could be living anywhere USA that's kind of the one thing that you know Vermont uh, you know has going had going for it in terms of education that we didn't have kids in class you know 40 50 60 kids in a class you know we have Little schools with little classes, and you know, go out in the local, you know, local community, see the, you know, local things going on. It's, you know, I, I thought that should be, if anything, preserved and cherished, you know, and not voted, you know, not voted to do something like that. But well, so what are some things you think Vermont is getting right? Huh. <laughs> you know, in the dollars and cents department, not much. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, if you go go north, you know, I think there's still, you know, like uh, up there in Caledonia, Joe Benning was running for uh, lieutenant governor. I mean, there's still places that kind of are trying to do it right, you know, quote unquote right, whatever right means, but more, I don't know, the, the, you know, Vermont style in terms of, you know, having more, you know, localized communities and, you know, trying to maintain, uh, you know, the culture of Vermont, you know, what what I consider to be the, the culture of Vermont, like a, more of a hands-on kind of, you know, farming, logging, excavating, you know, trades. It's, it's, it's you know, the quintessential backbone of this, of the state. Without any of that, there, you know, what, you know, farms, uh, excavation, go out, you know, <laughs> take a, 
Anybody ever taken a shovel out and you know trying to and you need and these are like critical to do anything in the state. You got to have have that. And I don't know. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that that you know a lot of folks in that sphere find themselves in the place they're in, like diesel fuel, uh, what it is now. I mean, that's not necessarily uh, you know any fault of Vermont. Uh, you know, per se, you know, as a state, you know, we don't have a handle on why the price of diesel is what it is, but we do have a handle in, you know, the type of legislation we pass, you know, as a representative body, I mean, uh, you know, and things like a carbon tax and, you know, demonizing the, you know, fossil fuel industry, you know, there's no, you know, there's no argument to that things like climate change and all these things are not something to be discussed, but at the same time, you know, it shouldn't be people, <laughs> real, you know, everyday people that come at the expense of all of the discussion. You know, as somebody that runs, an, you know, a guy who's running an excavation firm, you know, to put, to run his machines now costs double what it cost, you know, a year ago. Plus running fuel to the machines, everything revolves around, you know, the price of diesel. So now he's charging, you know, his customers more money. He's try, got to pay the people that he, you know, that work for him, more money. These are the, you know, what comes first in my mind is that guy that's running that, running that show, running that act. I don't care. I mean, do I care about carbon emissions? Sure. I mean, should we care about carbon emissions? Sure. But do I care about carbon emissions more than this guy over here that's running an excavation firm in, in my town that, you know, is telling me that, yeah, you know, I don't know how I'm going to stay in business. I'm probably going to sell everything and leave. So at the end of the day, you know, if you're representing people as a representative, then their concerns are your concerns. And these big set piece, you know, what pieces of legislation that, you know, like Vermont, you know, Montpelier likes to churn out and you know, kind of get on the national stage with, I don't see them as being, you know, where the focus should be. And it shouldn't, it's not, you know, it's, I, I think that's kind of led to where, you know, what Vermont could be doing right, it's not doing right. You know, it's doing, it's doing, the, it's doing, it's getting in its own way, I think. It's kind of a unique, I mean, for such a small state, it, you know, it trips on its own, you know, it has like extra long coattails for such a small place and it just keeps getting caught up in it. And it doesn't have to be that complicated if you just, you know, wipe all that away and look at what, what is real, what is Vermont? Like what, you know, is it a place that is suffering from, uh, you know, carbon emissions per se? Well, you know, if you look at the facts and figures, there's more trees here now uh, than when the first European settlers arrived. So I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, is there more snow, less snow? I don't, you know, you can look back through history. There were periods where there was no snow, you know, a hundred years ago. So I don't know. I don't know the answers to none of that, but I, you know, if there's no people left here, you know, in another five years, if they all move to South Carolina, I don't think it's not going to matter one way or the other about, you know, you know, how much it's snowing or not, because there won't be anybody here anyway. Well, do you think, do you think that we should be transitioning in some manner or fashion off of fossil fuels? Good question. I mean, sure, other places have done it. Germany's another, you know, prime example of that as well. I mean, they run, you know, up upwards of 80% of their industry on some form of, uh, you know, renewable energy. So it's obviously, uh, it's obviously possible. Um, can Vermont do something like that? I mean, in Vermont, I might kind of mentioned this in my last go around. Yeah, you could. I mean, you could have entire factory. You can go down in Springfield and put solar panels and windmills on every one of them old buildings and have small scale manufacturing facilities run on completely sustainable energy. Great. Why, why can't that be Vermont? Why don't, why couldn't Vermont do that? Why couldn't we be a, you know, the machine tool industry of the world again, completely self-sustainable? I mean, that would be epic and it would be a model that would be copied, you know, scores of times over everywhere but you know i see you know things like you know, unfortunately cannabis you know and it's always uh you know that's a it's a you know the easy way out so to speak you know we take a you know an easy way out we well, mentioned cannabis um you're on your local cannabis commission mm -hmm. right. so what what's the what's the situation like in plymouth are you will there be Retail shops, what, or well, first of all, why, why did you want to get involved? Or do you, do you want to open up that market or do you want to make sure that it, 
you know, doesn't get out of hand? What's your position on cannabis? More of the latter. I want to make sure it doesn't get out of hand. I was instrumental in creating our local cannabis control board. Uh, the reason being, um, I attended the symposium that they had in the summer. Uh, the cannabis, uh, the Vermont's cannabis control board, you know, Governor Scott appointed the 12 members, and they've been issuing licenses uh, all summer. Um, the local board gives us the ability to uh, scrutinize. There's six forms of licenses, if you don't know, but uh, you know the local board gives us the ability to scrutinize the retail license. Uh, the other f uh, five levels of licensure cannot be uh, regulated at all at the local level. Um, so, you know, via our zoning laws, we can you know ensure that whatever establishment may or may not want to sell cannabis, you know, is up to snuff like any other business would be in our town. That's basically where the rubber meets the road there uh, in terms of, um, you know, how I see it or why I'd want to be involved in it or how it could be done better. Um, I have a fundamental uh, not problem with the sale or grow, like I said to you earlier, you know, do it, you want to do it, great. But with how the legislation in Vermont's one of the, I think, I think there's two, correct me if I'm wrong, or check it in the edit, but I think there's only two states in the union that have done it via the legislature. You know, Vermont's one of them. Um, but I don't agree with the, uh, some of the methodology in terms of not thought through. And I've talked to Charlie Kimball about this, you know, several different times in terms of, you know, Vermont's take on it. And, uh, you know, I think it brings, if we look at uh, um, other states that have, you know, gone the same route, I think uh, Vermont probably could have taken a better and closer look at some of the mistakes that were made and brought their rollout methodology up to par to avoid some of those mistakes. I just think, unfortunately, Vermont will have growing pains mm -hmm. throughout the process and endure some of these mistakes that could be avoidable if it was done a little bit differently. What kind of mistakes? Uh, well, <laughs> for example, I think this is a primary one when, you know, you establish whatever you know the licenses for grow or by square footage so you set up a you know whatever 500 square foot grow uh you know you have x amount of plants and the idea is that you're allowed to have x amount of product but the plants uh especially you know hydroponic growth produce copious amounts of of sellable product so my question is always so what happens to all the all the extra you know, and the, it's inevitable, you know, this, the crickets that you get, well, uh, I don't know, you know, well, obviously it gets sold, you know, into, you know, the same market, you know, marijuana has always been sold into the black market, call it what you will. So there's, there, there's, uh, there are other ways to, you know, obviously approach that so that, you know, it's um, a, more, a better regulated process whereby we, you still don't have the, uh, you know, you still don't have that that element of it because, of course, marijuana is still a federally re regulated substance, which ties into one of my other concerns in terms of, you know, the uh, A, crime that it inevitably draws and B, the uh, scrutiny, uh, uh, you know, from the federal sphere that it draws. I mean, it's happened in other states like Montana, Colorado, you know. Uh, the DEA will come in, set up a you know new field office, and then they will begin to you know police up all the you know folks that are growing all the, you know weed and, and oh boy the nuts and bolts of it it's kind of a complicated process but it all is in the terms of how the wholesale uh, market is set up and you know how the you know the amounts are regulated that are sold to the you know wholesale so forth and so on but I I just don't get the impression that Vermont has all its uh, you know, I's dotted and T's crossed in that regard. And yeah, it seems like we're going to learn as we go. Um, I think I was reading recently that they're thinking there's going to be a shortage of of cannabis for sale because of the delay in getting the permits out. And we have a uh, 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 in Plymouth. We have a gentleman that did receive his uh, you know his grow license, and he's in the process of uh, of you know obtaining a uh, retail license and. Uh, you know, it looks like it should happen. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, that's the benefit of establishing that Woodstock doesn't have one. You know, if you have a local board, the state must inform the local board of the pending licensure. Uh, you know, if you don't, if a town doesn't, then the state just sends a receipt, 
you know, email saying that, you know, we've approved, you know, Joe Blow and he now has a license in your town. So there's a little bit of, you know, extra scrutiny by having the, having the board. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's when I don't agree with, you know, back to what we talked about before, you know, with the regulating on a moral imperative is not, you know, that shouldn't be the purview of any representative to step in and say, I don't, you know, you can't do it because I don't agree with it. Uh, that's kind of, yeah. that's where I draw the proverbial line. Well, hopefully we can get a bunch of new tax revenue in when the, when the whole system is up and running and put it to good use. Well, that's what I say, low hanging fruit there. I mean, I don't, uh, you know, dollars and cents. I don't, you know, you, there's other, you know, the effort and everything that goes into doing that. I, you know, I would say why, you know, why not put that mind power and effort into funding, you know, our green industrial projects, for example, I mean, which is a much more fundamental, you know, groundbreaking turning point kind of way forward as opposed to, you know, oh, okay, well, let's legalize, you know, marijuana sales and tax it. Okay, great. I mean, sure, we'll get tax revenue, but it's, I mean, do we want, if you stack everything up, is that, you know, like, I don't, is that what I would want to, you know, the legacy I'd want to leave my kid, for example? You know, like, oh, yeah, that's what we did in Vermont. <laughs> you know, I, suppose, I don't know. There's a bigger and better way to do everything, again, but it all boils down to political will and, you know, where you want to put your, you know, you put your, put your money, put your money where your mouth is. I don't know. It does seem like Vermont's a little behind the times, though, that I, it seems like even at the federal level, things are moving towards decriminalization, if not just outright legalization, because, you know, like you said, from that libertarian point of view, like, if you're doing something, you're not hurting anybody else, every, people are doing it anyway, why not take it out of the shadows, at least have some way to regulate it. Um, I, I think one of the benefits of legalizing and regulating is that maybe there will be less cannabis out there that's adulterated with bad stuff or is just too strong, especially for the younger people who are inevitably going to want to smoke it. Um, but it's kind of an experiment, like most things in government. <laughs> it's definitely going to be an experiment. Um, like I said, I went to the symposium and, you know, there weren't, <laughs> the, t the typical rejoinder was, it's a work in progress, it's a work in progress. So, you know, I, it's Definitely work progress as I see it. It's going to take time to hash it out. I, you know, and I think unintended. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, no, but yeah, you know, lo local level. I think that's a prime example of you know local level. That's something that should be in a rural state. The local officials should have some hand in, you know, you know what happens in, in the local community. It's it's not like in a you know wherever name a place. You know, it's a, just a different dynamic in Vermont. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're running as an independent. If you're elected, would you caucus with one party or the other, or would you stay totally independent? I mean, I'd like to think I'd stay totally independent. I think there's good ideas in, on both sides of the aisle. It's just a matter of, you know, how you're going to vote. And obviously, you know, everybody everybody gets up there and says they're going to do one thing, and a lot of people do another. But, yeah, you know, I just, I think, you know, the, I'm, the party... You know, which is why I'm running as an independent. I think the party system has a lot of detriment to it at this point. I think it's, you know, whether it's just that people are fed up with it or it's just that there's too much, you know, there's too much gridlock or there's too much of want, you know, like this is, Vermont's a super majority state. You have, you know, the one party that controls all the levers and, and both houses of the legislature. The other party has the governorship. And, you know, and it's now getting down to, you know, veto and, and you know, it's, so that's the ball game. It's, that's no way to run any place, whether it's Vermont or anywhere else. So I think a lot more uh, independence would be helpful for Vermont. And, and Vermont is, has that independence. It's one of the few states that actually can field independent uh, uh, representatives anyway. So why not, you know, why not roll with that? Yeah, well, I, I, I think one of the good things you know, despite supermajority in the legislature and Republican governor, uh, there are a number of progressives and independents that uh, both parties kind of have to cater to. You know, when they're on that razor's edge of veto override, you got to get enough progressives and or independents 
on board too. Um, but I, I agree that the two-party system, at least nationally, is broken. It's not an effective, efficient way of governing because it seems to devolve into my, my side versus your side, us versus them. It just becomes win-lose uh, and it just is getting worse, like almost tribal. There's, there's, there's very little appetite to compromise um, and it does seem like we need a, a, new, a new way of doing things. Without it, there won't, I mean, it, it only goes further th in this direction, which is not, you know, historically speaking, it's not conducive to uh, positive outcomes, <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, there's no, there's no way to uh, square the circle, so to speak, without some type of compromise. So getting on both, you know, one side of the trench or the other is not gonna, yep. not gonna make that happen. Spreading out to national politics for a moment, do you, do you have any preference for who you'd like to see run in 24 for the presidency? I kind of view that the same way I view the uh, party system. I, I don't think it won anyone. I think it, both the system itself and the problems that the nation, the country faces are so big that, you know, obviously the president has a say and a, a role in that, but I don't think that, you know, investing so much energy in that is, where people should put their priority. I think people should actually take a closer look at their local politics. I think people will be better suit, you know, better served to, you know, take a look what's going on in there. You know, like we have select board meetings, you know, it's, you know, I can take a pin and drop it and you'll hear it. I mean, nobody, you know, so yeah. come to your select board meetings, see who's running for state rep, you know, see who's, uh, you know, running, you know, for your state senators, you know, this is where all the big, Decisions that really affect your life are made. Act 46, Reading, school board, people not understanding where it came from. I mean, forget about, you know, yes, be concerned about who's running for president, but I just don't, you know, especially in the case of Vermont politics. I mean, Vermont doesn't decide. It's one of the first states to, you know, register its vote, but it doesn't ever decide a presidential race. So it doesn't really matter for us anyway. What really matters is the here and now. Will you be voting for Phil Scott for governor? Oh yeah, I, he has my vote. Yeah. I mean, for good or bad, Paul, I mean, he's, you know, however you want to weigh him on the political spectrum. I, mean, I, I certainly don't agree with some of his bigger decisions over the last few years, um, you know, and I'm <laughs> very angry with some of them, but at the end of the day, he's proven that he can, he can govern, so. It does seem like Vermonters do want to find some, some party balance given the fact that they elect a supermajority in the legislature but a lot of the same folks who vote for Democrats for House and Senate will also vote for for Phil Scott so we seem to be a little bit different in some ways than the national trend where you know people can vote across party lines um, if they want to achieve a little more balance and they're just not like devoted to one party or another absolutely I think that goes back to what I said earlier. You know, the, there is an undercurrent, you know, of independent voting. You know, he, it's kind of a it's a natural undercurrent in Vermont. So, and you know, the parties are, you know, especially the Republican Party has always been somewhat, you know, it's unfair to characterize it, you know, in the national context. It's Vermont Republican Party has been a different animal um, than the national for quite some time, and you know. I think Phil Scott is a reflection of that. You know, Scott Milne, uh, who ran uh, for several different uh, uh, positions over the few, last few years, he, he's another one. I mean, he's you know more of that, a more typical Vermont style of Republican that you know can bring people over, you know, from the other side of the aisle in large numbers because he's you know he actually can you know, see the validity of what, you know, of the ideas that they're, they're putting forth. So to wrap up, how can voters uh, learn more about you? Do you have a website? Will you be appearing at any forums before the election? Uh, forums, we're supposed to have a forum, uh, I believe in either the second or third week of uh, October, waiting to hear back from Patrick Cody of uh, Chemo Valley TV. Uh, so there'll be a, a forum there that uh, voters can come to and, uh, hear me uh, hash it out with my rival uh, and my website, of course, which is ktcapolini.com. Spell your last name. Uh, it's 
C-A-P-P-E-L-L-I-N-I. -L -L -I -I. So it'd be uh, ktcapellini.com. You can. I'll, I'll put it on the screen too. You can read about uh, my background there, my positions, my platform, um, and I did send out uh, a mailer uh, recently. Uh, it's supposed to be arriving in uh, mailboxes across the district uh, beginning today. So you may have already received it by the time you see this video. Well, Keith, thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, best of luck on the campaign trail. And if you get elected, we'd like to have you back and talk to you again sometime. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. All right.